Major support for Do the Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Bakersfield West Rotary Stroop Family Foundation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, Kern High School District, and AC Electric Company, with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael. I'm Devin. And in studio with us, we have Aubrey. And Aubrey, if somebody needed to get a hold of us, what would they need to do? For math homework help, call in Bakersfield 636-4357 or toll free 1-866-636-6284. Email dothemath at curran.org. We're online at dothemathonline.net and on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right, nicely done. Thank you for doing that. Why don't you let everybody know where you go to school and what grade you're in? I go to Stockdale Elementary, and I'm in fifth grade. How is fifth grade? It's probably one of my favorite years so far. So, so what has made it one of your favorite years? All the opportunities you get. Like, you could run for office. You have... Yeah. So student government, you get to be able to do something like that. So mm -hmm. what did you run for? Did you run for something this year? Yeah, I ran for vice president. Very good. And how did you do? I won. You won, so it makes it even better, right? Yeah. Now, I think in fifth grade, you can also start playing a band instrument. Mm -hmm. Have you done that? I play orchestra. I play the viola. All right, good. And let's see, there's after school sports, I think, fifth graders can do. Do you do any of that? No, but my friends do. Okay. <laughs> so there are a lot of opportunities for you, like you were talking about, in fifth grade to start doing some extracurricular activities. Yes. And you, that's the part you like, right? Yes. How do you like your math so far in fifth grade? It's okay, but sometimes it gets a little hard. Yeah? yeah. Well, that's why you're here. So if you need a little help, we can help you out. But <laughs> we're going to have you do a problem that you're kind of familiar with right now. So over to the board, young lady, let's take a look at the first problem. So let's take a look at it together. It says... Hetty is stacking paper cups. Each stack of 15 is six inches high. What is the total height of 10 stacks? So we can see one stack is six inches, two stacks is 12. So we need to know what 10 is. So if you could explain to Devin how you're going to solve this. So you could see that one times six, so that's one times six equals six. And that pattern goes on. So two times six equals 12 and three times six equals 10. So I'm pretty sure that you do 10 times 6, which is 60. So that's the total height of the step. So what this means is that 10 stacks of those cups would be 60 inches tall. Now, you recognize the pattern of multiplication, mm -hmm. that the stacks times 6, if they're 6 inches tall, is going to get you the total stack. Do you notice a pattern even just going horizontally with the height? Add 6, add 6, and... So something that I think was really helpful is the fact that you recognize that pattern going vertically. Because let me ask you this. If people recognize that pattern skip counting across the way, what do you think they might put over here? Um, they would put 18 plus 6, which is 24. So they might say that the stack of uh, 10 stacks would be only 24 inches tall, which really reasoning-wise wouldn't make sense. So you were able to make that connection using multiplication as the rule. So what would you say is the rule then? If there was a rule that we had to associate, if you had a certain number of stacks, let's say we don't know how many stacks we have, what's the rule? Multiply the stacks by six. So, so why do we choose six? Six, what does six represent? The height. In what unit? In inches. So if each, unit, if each stack is six inches tall, then the rule is multiply the number of stacks the uh, number of stacks by six inches. 
multiply number of stacks, I think we said, right? And that would get us the total height of all the stacks together. Mm -hmm. there, you go. there you go. Nicely done. Great first problem right there. You can leave that on the board so you can fill out your homework paper right there. <laughs> we do have phone tutors available until 530 as we do most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. Time now for today's Math in the News. Today's Math in the News, we are fortunate once in a while to have somebody in studio with us. And from the Arts Council of Kern, we have David Gordon. Welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Why don't you let everybody know what your role is with the council and then kind of overall what the council does. My role is I'm the executive director of the Arts Council. And what we do is we provide support for arts advocacy, access, and education for all of Kern County residents and our visitors. Okay, so what are some of the things that you guys do during the year? So what we do is, um, if someone has an idea in the arts that they would like to see happen, well they oftentimes come to the Arts Council and we figure out how to make that happen. And so if someone wants to, let's say, uh, do a program to teach veterans how to play keyboard or guitar. Okay. Uh, we will figure out how to put that class together, how to finance it, um, how long it goes, um, where it would be. Um, we also do things like um, uh, the Art Walk downtown Bakersfield the first uh, Friday of every month. So we have artists that come to the Arts Council and we put together, you know, the first Friday event and have places for them to go, uh, what size places, uh, the times, the security, and set that whole festival up so people in Bakersfield can come see what artists do. Right, and I know that I've been there a few times and it's always great because you meet a lot of different people and the different types of art that they do. Exactly. And then you can, I mean, I use that to incorporate into my own classroom. Mm -hmm. You brought up an interesting point about the music because I think when a lot of people think about arts, they think about painting, making something like that, but the music is also part of that. Absolutely. So if it has anything to do with arts, right. you guys are going to be able to help them. Exactly. Yes. We um, do a lot of mural projects for cities. We do a lot of grant programs for cities in Kern County. Um, we do acting things acting is an art theater is an art and we have a very rich theater um you know I mean, there are a lot of places in, in this in town bakersfield and so yeah we will help people pull off performances uh we do uh april is national poetry month so we do events then we started the first kern county poet laureate who uh, represents kern county when we do poetry things um, so we have we we do a lot of programs we help fraser park and their radio station um, get equipment so they can better represent artists and um, record what artists are doing there up in the mountain and then broadcast it and really spread the word that art is a vocation. It is something that is trainable. It is something that will um, bring you monetary investment, will keep a roof over your head. It's a job. And I know some people think just like math, well I'm not very good at it. I can't get very good at it. You can so get you very can. good. Yes, now, when can. I was speaking with you a couple of weeks ago, and we kind of coordinated to bring you into the Do the Math studio, you brought up some numbers that I found interesting, which is what I want you to touch on a little bit right now. Yeah, exactly. There's something called the creative economy. And the creative economy is a, is a study of what um, jobs are available in the state and in the nation. And it, it really talks about how much the arts supports our economy in California. And the arts generate 15% of our economy in the state. It, um, in, ex in direct numbers, it employs a million point six people in California. And then from those direct artist jobs, it ripples out and supports another million dollars in um, vocations that have 
that are there only because of the arts. So you might have a production company in Hollywood, you might have a fashion house, you might um, have a publishing house for authors, because you know writing mm -hmm. is an art. Well, then you also have the people that do catering events, you have costume design, you Windows, have fabric stores, right. you have, um, you have uh, all sorts of lighting companies, you have security, you know, all the things that go to run something that is producing a creative element. So you think about theaters, not just live theaters, but you think about film theaters that are showing, you know, animated features that are happening or, you know, full feature links. So yeah, it's man, not just, it's not just painting and drawing at all. In fact, you know, it's much larger than that. And colleges offer lots and lots of degrees in the arts because it is such a huge part of our economy and, and what makes us you know creative and what makes us interesting and what brings us the variety in life and um, and so it's it's something that people are just now discovering and one of the soft core um, things that uh, that uh, employment is looking for is people that can be creative in their job and have a lot creative of different areas. ways like you were doing here different ways to come at a problem new ways to come out of a problem. Right. Now, you've been with the council for a while. The what while. are some of the things that are going to be coming up? We have, of course, our first Friday is something I always look forward to, but we also have something called the Plain Air Painting Festival that's coming up. And that is something, Plain Air Painting is painting on site. That means if someone is going to paint a building or paint a mountain, they're going to be standing in front of the mountain or standing beside the building. It's not working in a studio. Okay. So we are inviting 15 of some of the best plein air painters to Kern County to paint for a week. And then we show that work and we uh, sell that work. And it's also a competition where we have a, ju a judge come into town and then they pick winners and those winners get um, award money for doing this. And okay. these festivals are all over the world, actually. And so I thought, you know, Kern County is a beautiful place. Bring them here. Yeah, we have everything but a beach. So, um, yeah, and these people are working and they're making money at this festival by their craft. And a lot of these people have worked for Disney and Paramount and now they are painting full time. And so they come here and they work for a week and then we work on supporting them. And when is that coming up? That is April 20th through the 25th. And if somebody wanted to get more information about that, where would they need to go to? Kern Arts, which is probably easier to remember, dot org. So right, just so think about Kern and Arts. Kern Arts. Yeah, dot org. Dot org. Well, you yes. know what, David, we certainly do appreciate you taking hey, out some time. Hey, thank you. I know you're a busy guy, a lot of stuff going on, and just to come over and share a little bit of information with us is greatly appreciated. Well, thank you for having me. All Keep right. up the good work. And that is today's Math in the News. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30 this afternoon, but right now we have an opportunity to go see Dr. Lee, an optometrist here in town. Today we are at Li and Liao Optometry and I am with Dawson Li. Hi. Hello. I should doing? say Dr. Dawson Li. Excuse how me. How are you doing? Can you kind of tell us we're here at your Brim Hall location? Can you kind of tell us what your business is? Sure, so we're optometrist. Um, we have four doctors here, myself included. Been in Bakersfield since 2001 and when people think optometry, they think glasses and contacts. Absolutely without question, that's our our main purpose, but really our underlying goal is to you know, improve quality of life through vision, and that's through eye exams, keeping our eyes healthy, preserving vision, relating eye health to body health. Again, you got one body, one set of eyes, so we have to take good care of them, of course. Yes. Nobody wants to lose vision. Yes. And of course, a big part of what we do, again, is, you know, you take a look around, it's it's the fashion part. Thankfully, we have, we've come a long way, Yeah. right? If you wear glasses, I remember when I was a kid, I had big glasses yeah. and not the most aesthetic or yes. attractive glasses and I think that's what a lot of people think. Yes. Um, but we've come a long way with fashion and technology that applies to glasses and that applies to contact lenses, again freedom from glasses. Um, and of course we do eye health. In big school we have air quality issues, so allergies are a big problem, dry eyes are a big problem, health, diabetes high blood pressure cholesterol for our society now super duper common uh, every day i'll probably see maybe 10 12 patients a day with some type of physical ailments mm -hmm. not 
And those folks may not realize how uh, those health problems can affect our eyes and our vision. And inevitably, at the end of the day, nobody wants to lose vision. Yes. So, but there's just a disconnect of eye health to vision, and so we try yeah. to put those two together for our patients. I know that over the years, I've never worn glasses until a couple of years ago. Now it's like slowly, I can't see far. I can't see yeah, close up. This it's one's like a, this one's a bad <laughs> one. Yeah, you're not alone. Yeah. So we won't get into that detail too much, yeah. but it does happen to everybody. That's just us maturing is how I say it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Good way to put yeah. it. Now, can you kind of tell us where we are right now in your office? Sure. So we, uh, again, a big part of what we do is sun protection in Bakersfield. So we've got a great, you know, a uh, large selection of sunglasses that we can do prescription or non-prescription, of course. And again, nowadays, you know, people want to look good uh, in addition for the function. Uh, so we definitely believe in fashion and we want people to feel good about, you know, their appearance and feel confident in what they do and how they see for performance, for safety, for driving, for sports. Uh, that's a big part of, you know, what we try to emphasize. Yeah. So we've got clear glasses, sunglasses, of course, the whole thing. And then you said this is the sunglass area? Yes. Right. So if I have a prescription, I could come in and match that to sunglasses. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, but this is also just sunglasses, no prescription? Or is it Pretty both? much everything we have here is non-prescription okay. for someone who does not need glasses, who's fortunate enough not to, or who wears contact lenses. But pretty much we try to carry a large variety where majority of what we have does uh, allow for a prescription put into them. So if someone who doesn't want to wear contacts yeah. or uh, they're just not comfortable with putting things in their eye more than anything else. It's very easy to grab some sunglasses and put prescriptions in them so they can see well. Yeah, I know my running partner, she has the prescription sunglasses mm -hmm. that she runs with. Yeah. Okay, so when we come back, mm -hmm. we are going to actually be going into one of your, your rooms, correct? Yes. And we're going to be doing a little bit of math. Yeah, definitely. I want to show the, show the kids how, you know, in real world, how numbers and math matters. It's not so much just for a test. Yeah. It's applicable for everything we do. Um, but in our profession, a lot of it is, is prescription-based, which is a number. Mm -hmm. There's a plus and a minus, and I'll kind of discuss real briefly that. Um, we, when we document and monitor health, we, we put values on it. You know, it could be glaucoma with what are your pressures. That's a numerical value. It could be the appearance of certain blood vessels, the nerves in the back of the eye, again, different values. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes you can say a value of one to four or one to ten even. Um, so so we have a lot to get into, right? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so we're going to send it back to the, to the studio for right now, but we'll be coming back again in a little bit. All right, thanks for that, Mary Lou and Dr. Lee. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30. In studio, we have Aubrey, a fifth grade student from Stockdale Elementary. And have you been at Stockdale for a long time? Since kindergarten. Since kindergarten, so you're pretty used to it. Yes. You'll be at the top of the hill next year also, right? Sixth grade? All right. Well, you know what? Time for you to do more math. You ready? <laughs> yeah. Over to the board, young lady. Here we go. Your next homework problem. What expression could describe the number of squares in the next figure in the pattern? So in figure one, we have two, and they're side by side. Figure two, we have four, and on the third one, we go down one. So you can make four across. And figure three, we'll go six across. There you go. So we need to know the number of squares in the next figure. So something really interesting to consider is how the figures keep changing. This is figure one, figure two, figure three. Let's take this one step at a time and see if we can come up with a pattern. How do you see figure one changing to figure two? Um, the amount of squares, so. So let me ask you a question then. Where are the original two in this figure? Where do you see those? Right here, one, two. One, two, so you see this first two over here in this mm -hmm. first spot. I'm gonna go ahead, and if that's okay, I'm just gonna kind of shade that a little bit of a blue here, right? So you see, the next three being added over here, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's really interesting because this is one of those things a lot of people can see a lot of different ways. So we're gonna say this is figure one, this is figure two. So now, if we look at where figure two is, where do we see that in this group here? Figure two right here. So you see figure two, why don't you go ahead and uh, outline that in, let's go with the blue, yeah, go ahead.
Okay. So you see the three being added here then over on the sides. So let me ask you a question. If you were asked to draw figure four, what would that look like? I would add three, one, two, three to it. Okay, so maybe we can kind of expand this out a little bit and give us a bit more room here. Let's look full page there. All right, let's go ahead and draw that figure. So the original figure would be like this and then If you want, you can draw it. There we go. Okay. And then I would add one right here, one right here, and one right here. So, oh, yeah. I got you. Our figure one had two, figure two had five, and figure three had eight. So how many are going to be in figure four here? Eleven, because eight plus three equals eleven. So it's really interesting. Maybe we can go back a little bit too. Yeah, there's going to be 11 squares in this. You could almost take a look at figure two and say that this is your original two, and then you're adding one here, one here, and one there, and recognize, oh, maybe that's the pattern. That's where the three are showing up as a new set. But it's really interesting how we can see the same thing a little bit differently and still get to the same point. So we're going to say that figure four is going to have 11 squares. Very interesting. So we can represent that as 8 plus 3 equals 11. In fact, what we could try to figure out is a general rule for any number figure. So that we could say, well, maybe let's see, if we're adding 3 to each one, and then we're taking a certain amount uh, and, and configuring that, maybe that's going to tell us this. So maybe there's a table that would help us with this, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I know this when, when we had a table, we saw a pattern there. So let's say we had figures, and on the bottom we had numbers, okay? So... Right, and I think what you're doing is important, trying to find a rule, because right. at some point it's going to say something like, how many squares would be in the 38th figure? And you nobody wants to draw the 38th of that. this thing. Exactly, right. right. Oh my gosh. I'm going to need a bigger smartphone. <laughs> so, if we had figure 1 had 2, figure 2 had... 5, figure 3 had 8, and figure 4 had 11. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we notice something happening here. How much is this going up by each time? 3. 3. Now, is this simply just multiplying this by 3? Like, is 1 times 3 equal to 2? Mm -hmm. When we multiply it by 3, we still have to do something to get it back to 2. So what do we have to do to 3 to get it to 2? Minus 1. So what you're saying is that if we multiply this times 3 and then take 1 away, we might be able to figure this out for any number. So let's say let, we can just substitute like a variable. Let's say the letter n, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say we're going to take figure n. You're saying that if we multiply n by 3 and then take that away, take 1 away from that, we would know exactly how many squares would be in that figure. Mm -hmm. So we could do that with anything. We could just predict now. We're going to see the future here. Let's say we do figure 10. Okay. Okay. How many squares would be in figure 10? 29. 29. Wonderful. You didn't have to do all that drawing out or anything like that. We just used your rule. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. There you go. Nicely done. Well, since you did so well on that, I've got another problem for you right now. A uh, little side thing here first, though. Devin, you and I are both from back east. Way back. Do you ever remember running into uh, anybody in the Angelino family? Have you ever met somebody Not from the Not in my Angelino? part of Staten Island. Not right. necessarily. I remember there was south, a kid though. that went to our school, Chris Angelino. Okay. So we're going to take a look at this next problem. It just was funny that this person's name is in here. All right. So here's the problem Aubrey has to do. Ms. Angelino made two pans of lasagna and cut them both into twelfths. Ooh. Her family ate one and one twelfth pans of lasagna. How many pans of lasagna were left? So explain to Devin how you're going to solve this problem. So I would represent the pans as circles. 
Ooh, Mike, do they have circular lasagna where we grew up in uh, New York? I don't remember a circular one, but if that's the way she wants to solve it, by all of means, course. go ahead. No, I'm, I'm eager to learn all cultures all over the place. And then I would make them all into 12. So start with four. And then. Hmm. So right now you've got eight. Mm -hmm. Then I would make one more right there and one more right there. It's kind okay. of sloppy. But <laughs> so the challenge here is that maybe not each slice is the same size, but we do have 12 slices <laughs> in each pan here. Okay. Okay. So then I would take the pants and I would... So they ate one and one twelfth pans. Yeah, so I would shade in this all the way, like this little thing, and then okay. one and one twelfth, right? Correct. Correct. So we have one, this is our one, and this one sliver is our one twelfth. Mm -hmm. So then I would count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So they would have eleven twelfths lasagna left. 11 twelfths of a pan sounds pretty good. That's a lot. That's lunch. That's dinner. That might be breakfast. For well, see, it all depends upon the size of these pans, too, you know, so. Good. And you know what? It's funny. I've never had a circular lasagna. Right? Like, is and I'm sure, you? I mean, like, you take something, you would bake a cake or something, and I guess you could do it. You could do maybe, like, one of those, rectangular. like, Chicago deep dish pizza pans, and you could do it in there. <laughs> you like that deep dish? No. Uh, neither do I. I'm, just, I'm not a fan <laughs> of it myself. Anyway. I'm not allowed to. But anyway, Aubrey, some great work right there. And for your great work, you've got yourself a couple of tickets to go see the Bakersfield Condors. Hey. That season is in full swing, so hopefully you have oh, an opportunity to go check out one of those games <laughs> soon. Hey, we do have phone tutors available until 530. We'll be back with more right after this. Today we're at Quailwood Elementary, home of the Cougars, and we're here to... United! Once again, we're at Quailwood Elementary, and we have sixth grade students, and we're going to work on some more number patterns. You guys ready? Yes. yes. All right. So... There's yours, and yours, and yours. And what you're going to do is you're going to look for the pattern and Thanks. see if you can use all six clues to figure out the correct order. All right? So let's go ahead, read your first clue. So those of you that have pattern of piles, right? The second pile has one fifth as many of the fifth pile. Okay, so you're going to have piles of blocks, let's say, right? So you're going to have different piles next to each other. And you need to figure out how many piles there are and how many is in every pile, okay? Read one of your clues. The sixth number is the third number times four and it is, and it is the first number times eight. That sounds like fun, huh? <laughs> all right, so those of you that have what's the pattern, you're going to have to look for a pattern, and they're all going to be numbers, not piles of things. But yours are going to be numbers of things in that pile. You guys get the idea? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So remember, take a look at all the clues and start working out what you think the sequence might be. All right? Go. Paper? Yeah. Use that one right there. Okay. Right, try that, right? Because as long as it's working, keep going with it. So, do we have the fifth number yet? Okay, so the fifth number is the third number 
plus the fourth. The third number. So what's the third plus the fourth? Four. Five. Five. So we know the next number is five. five. All right. Four. So we've done that one. Right. So now we need the sixth number. Where does it talk about the sixth number? Right. The sixth number is the third number times four. Okay. So what's the third number? Two. Times four. Eight. Whoa. Hold on, sister. And it is the first number times eight. So is two, two times four eight? And is one times eight eight? Yes. Then we know what that is. Eight. When you add the first six numbers together, the sum is 20. So when you add all of those up, do you get 20? Make sure of it. Eight, that adds 20. I got 24. I mean 20. You got 20, right? Okay, so what do they want to know now? What's the last thing? Seven. They want to know... What the seventh number is, right? Yeah. So here, if we take one plus one, what do we get? Two. If we take one plus two, what do we get? Three. If we take two plus three, we get? Five. If we take three plus five, we get? Eight. So in order for this, we need to go five plus eight. Ooh. There you go. You guys solved it. Nicely done. The sixth grade students at Quellwood Elementary. Today we're at Quellwood Elementary, home of the Cougars, and we're here to... Do the Let's go! You have to make noise. Okay, two <laughs> And a big thanks once again to the students over at Quellwood, home of the Cougars. We have Aubrey in studio with us, a fifth grade student from Stockdale Elementary, but we do have another opportunity to head back out and visit with Dr. Lee and Mary Lou. We are back at um, Lee and Liao Optometry and I am with Dr. Dawson Lee. And we were talking previously and you have some math for us. You were talking positive negatives and that sounding like my world of right. integers. Yes, <laughs> so on an integer scale, zero being perfect, zero, and then you have plus and minus on either side, right? The further you, away you go, that's how our prescriptions are. So the, everyone's heard of nearsightedness and farsightedness mm -hmm. and sometimes astigmatism, all very commonplace terms that everyone's heard of. When someone's nearsighted, we actually assign them a negative value. If they're farsighted, we assign them a positive value. So the more farsighted it is, the further away, the higher the plus number, plus five versus plus one. Plus five, very farsighted, mm -hmm. plus one, a little bit farsighted. Nearsighted, the opposite. Someone's very nearsighted, minus 10. Can't see past here. Someone's a little bit nearsighted, minus two, right? So that's our sliding scale. So that's a lot of what we do every day, mm -hmm. right? What's your prescription? How well do you see? How poorly do you see? This is called a ferropter. And inside this little machine, there's all these little different lenses. Plus, minus, from zero, plus a quarter, plus a half, all the way up to, I forget, plus 13 this machine goes. and minus 16 even. So the same lenses that are in here, basically a full drawer, if I can get this out, yeah. of wow. similar lenses. And these were just, we use periodically and we pull them out. So that's a plus a quarter and it goes to plus 20 in this case. And so are those what you're sliding in, in there? In essence, yes. Okay. Right. But they're all, it's automated in, in a contained okay. unit. Because I know that I've done this before where I see they're clicking and mm -hmm. changing yeah. things. Yeah. So basically every time a lens goes through, it's going through all these different okay. lenses. So if you can look in my eyes, that's pretty big. This, not too big. So you see that difference yes. there, right? Yes. <laughs> so that's really someone who's really bad yes. and someone who's less bad. So again, very far-sighted, mildly far-sighted. Okay. Um, so that's an example of, that, of what we do day in, day out. And when we write the prescription out for our patient, it's written in the same format, mm -hmm. plus or minus. Yes. And then um, Actually, it could be a point system as well in there with uh, additional numbers that I don't want to get too complicated yeah. with because it's, it's just goes on forever. So once they are here, right, this mm -hmm. is kind of where you're, you're checking out and seeing what's going on. Yes. Where do you go from there? So again, that's a lot of what we do. What's your prescription? Get it seeing as good as we can. Um, and that's a big part of the exam. But the second part of the exam is eye health. 
you know, taking good care of what we got, evaluating the health for eye disease, glaucoma, cataracts, uh, macular degeneration, blood vessel issues related to blood, uh, blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, all those things, even medications. Mm -hmm. So we do take a look inside the back of the eye, but we do have, you know, some instrumentation we use in the office to help with that. So this is a, a 3D scan, in essence, of the back of the eye, the retina in particular. You can see the different layers here to the retina. I'll use my cursor, that'll help. So the different th top layer, middle layer, innermost layers, but really, again, back to numbers. It's great to look at it, but how do we compare to year to year without values? Okay. Hence, numbers, right? So there's values and values, they either stay the same, mm -hmm. they go up, they go down. And that's how you're able to monitor for change. So you have your constant. You, you have a constant, you've got a baseline, and over time, if things happen, they're gonna cause some certain cause and effects in the back of the eye. Yeah. So down here, this instrument, you'll see, has some numerical values. And, and it's actually measuring the thickness, so 283 in this quadrant versus 279 down here, middle a little bit thinner. Again, small the number, thinner the retina. So you were just talking quadrant, and I, I'm going graphs. Is each one of these then a, a quadrant? I mean, uh, a region, quadrant. Okay. Uh, so I, probably quadrant's not exactly the best term, um, but it's a certain region to the macula area. Uh, it's just kind of cornered off, I guess, okay. uh, so it's easier to kind of compare and contrast. Um, so that's one way we use measurements. Um, and down here, again, same thing, uh, more numerical values, right? And so it's measuring the retina. Here you have a scale as well where, um, you know, the blue line is a little thinner, the little here less than, average, thinner or thicker, and then even thicker there. So again, it's color-coded with numerical values, just one way we measure the thickness. Here, a different instrument, we're actually taking a look in the back of the eye, again, comparing health, um, comparing the blood vessels. I kind of put emphasis on that with health concerns. But in particular, this right here is called the optic nerve, and that's the cable plugging in the back of the eye. Well, with cables, what do cables do? They send data. For our kids, any kids who play Nintendo, PlayStation, Xbox, they know out of the computer, links to the monitor. That's the HDMI cable. Okay. Connecting the eye to the brain. Okay, and if someone cut the cable, what happens? Can't play anymore, right? Yes. So in essence, that's what this is. That connects the eye to the brain, sending all the data. Um, now, we're also measuring it, again, values. And here we're measuring actually the overall size. And we're comparing this middle area here called the cup, which is the core. And it's really hard to kind of gauge in this image, truthfully, but it's about four tenths the size of the hole, meaning that circular cup takes up four tenths the size of the hole okay. versus a smaller cup, maybe two tenths. A larger cup would make maybe eight tenths. So it, it's something that we measure. Every eye doctor does an exam. We're actually measuring the size of the optic nerve and comparing and contrasting over time. Wow. So again, numerical value, yes. value to measure change. Um, that's one there. So A lot of math in it. Oh, well, for sure. we still have a lot more to talk about, okay. but for right now, we do have to send it back to the studio, and then when we come back, we will have even more. So back to you, Mike. All right, thanks for that, Mary Lou. And we do have a lot more to get to because we have Aubrey, a fifth grade student from Stockdale in studio, ready to do an amazing problem for us. This has nothing to do with your homework. Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah, enthusiastically, Maybe. she says. All right, here we go. Devin, on the board, draw me a rectangle, 11 by 13. Let's do an 11 by 13 rectangle. You can make it inches, feet, there whatever size you want, but label it All 11 right. by 13. There we go. All right, Aubrey, here's what you need to do. I need you to figure out the fewest number of squares hmm. that will fit in that rectangle. Let me do us a favor Once here. you figure out the fewest number of squares that will fit in there, I need you to explain it to me so that it proves that that is the fewest number go. of squares that will fit. Let's get rid of that shape here. We only need this. So let's go with a, just a regular, yes. So let's go with this. So we're looking at an 11 by 13 rectangle and we got to figure out a way to break it down into those, here we go. That's the one I want. So we're going to break this down. 11 by 13. I just wanted to get something that didn't look so much like a square when we're trying right. to work with squares. So, what would be your first step here? Um, like 11 lines, because you have 11. We're going to have a lot of little squares here. Okay. So, what part do you think 
I feel like I should salute this. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, you've got 13 stripes. So Vertically, <laughs> right? Should be like Count them up, yeah. Let's make sure you've got 11. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay. And then 13. 1. So by the time we're done, we're going to have um, 11 rows with 13 squares in each row. Yeah. And Mike, what's the challenge again that she's trying to accomplish here? The fewest number of squares that will fill that entire rectangle. Okay. So right now it looks like we've got the most number of squares yeah. we could fit right. into this Right, you've rectangle. got 143 squares up there. Right. So what I need you to do, it might be easier if you use a different color as you outline squares that you make so that you can see it a little bit easier. However you want to do it though, it's up to you guys. Yeah. Go ahead and play around with the colors or how you want to kind of visualize what you need. The fewest number of squares you can fit in there. And the whole thing must be completely full. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead, yellow. Um. So kind of what's, what's your kind of thought process right here as far as your strategy for the second round? Making... Um the squares bigger, like adding all these together. Okay, so you want to work with bigger squares, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, are you looking for the largest size square possible? Are you looking for a middle sized or kind of what's your what's your attempt here? Trying to find the um, smallest and then working up because I'm not too okay. sure. So you want to continue to try, jump into this and get some momentum every time. Mm -hmm. So our first attempt ended up with 143 squares. So we're looking for fewer squares in this attempt. Yeah. Okay. So how big of a first square do you want to try here? I'll try... I'm not sure. Um... Share this. Okay, so we're looking for something, and if it's going to be a square, and again, we're just kind of modeling this, we want it to be the same number of squares oh, up yeah. and down. So is this going to be a 4x4 four well, four or a 5x5? Five 4x4. Five? Four four. Okay, let's go ahead and undo that, and we'll work with a 4x4. Four 4x4. Four. Four. All right. So you're going to go ahead and keep making 4x4 four four squares. Oh, wait. I think that one was a 3x4. Until... We get to a certain point. Are you going to continue to try to make four by four squares? No. Or are you going to have a different approach for this attempt? Different approach. Okay, keep the yellow because I think that's going to help us mark on this one. So what's your next size square going to be? Five by five. Well, let's make some five by five squares. Well, you can't use those ones again. I think she's jumping into a second Oh, so she's going to go five by five yeah. instead of four by four? Okay. She can kind of change her approach here. Got you. Okay. Okay. Are we able to make any more five by five squares with what we have? Five, one, two, three, four. I don't think that would be a right approach because you'd have one left right here. Okay. So you realize as soon as you, I think what you're seeing is as soon as you end up with like one row or column, then the number of squares is going to be higher because you have either 13 going this way or 11 going this way. Okay, so I notice a pattern though. I notice that in each of these attempts the squares are getting bigger. Is there a way you can maybe skip a few of these steps and just kind of get to the... Um, well, let me ask you this. What, would, what could be the largest square that would take up the most space? Mm. 11 by 13. Hmm. But it. So. Let me get it. We're gonna go with. Let's go with yeah. blue. Good contrast. So, um. Go by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. A we'll, 7? We'll do a 7 by 7. seven. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Well, that wouldn't work because you'd have 6. Well, what, okay, but could you make a six by six square over here? Yes. Okay, let's go ahead and cut that out, maybe towards the bottom so we don't leave this gap down here. Okay, so let's look at the spaces we have left and see what we can do with this space. 
we have 5 high until we get over here, and then we have 4 high. Mm -hmm. And this space is 7 across, and this one is 6. One, two, three, four, five, this size. So is that going to be 3x3? Three three. Three? I think that might be 3x4 here. Oh, Let's go yeah. ahead and just undo that piece. So you want to make a 3x3 three three square, OK? So we have 3x3. Three three. And another 3x3. Three three. OK. And then you have a 2x2. Two two. We could do 2x2. Two two. Two do we have some additional 2s up here? Yes. Well, maybe instead of doing four 2x2 two two squares, what could we do? Oh, hold on a second. Let's try that. Go ahead and let's click done there. Let's try to clear those out. Make one, two, three, four. There we one, go. One, two, three, four. So we're going to turn that into a big four by four square. Okay. And then a four. So we have a four by three left over on that side, right? What's the largest square we can make over here? Three. Okay. And then we're going to have, looks like, three small one by one squares here. Would you be able to kind of mark those out? And then what is going to happen over here? We have two by six. Two by six. Yeah. Four. OK. Four. All right. So let's count and see how many squares we've broken this into now. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 10 11, 11, 12. 12. Is that less than 143? Yes. That's a great. That's a great jump, but that is the fewest. good. So you you cut it down quite a bit. So you're at twelve. What I need you to do now is see if you can get it to ten or under, oh. because under. it is possible to get quite a few more. So let's see if you can get it to ten or fewer squares. All right. So, do you want to kind of clear this out, or do you want to keep what you have and uh, just use a different color? I'll use a different color. Go for it. We're going to go with the deep red here. Or green. You know what? Green yeah, would green. be a very good contrast with yeah. everything else that's there. All right. So, one, no, it's the same as two. Actually, wait. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You're going with the well, largest. I think she just figured out what you wanted to do in the first place. Because that's very helpful in starting. Because right. it lets you chop out as many squares as possible. Okay, so we have one giant, humongous square, the largest square we can make. Two. And then you're creating two by two squares out of what's left. How many of those squares were you able to create? Um, one, two, three, four. Five. Five. And then we have two more up here, which mm -hmm. is how many? Six, seven. So we have eight. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we went from 143 to 12 to 8. That's excellent work right there. You can get even fewer, no. but I'm not going to make you do that right now because it will take a little longer and I've got oh, another oh, problem oh, I want you to work on. Oh, All right? Oh, oh. Colorful as that is, we're going to let you rest at 8. But keep in mind, it can get fewer than that. All right? So erase the board, and I'm going to give you guys a couple of moments to do the 4-4. Four four. So Devin, put 4-4s four uh -huh. up on the board for us, please. Great. Let's go Aubrey, ahead. select the number between 1 and 9. All right, so we're going to make it all equal to 8. So, Aubrey, you have to add, subtract, multiply, divide all four fours so that it all comes out to equal 8. So, order of operations is going to be your best friend. Devin can help you, but not too much. So, I would... You've got I mean, four minutes to do the four fours to equal 8. I would add this to make 8 times 4 equals 32 divided by... Four oh. equals eight. So how can we write this out as one expression lengthwise? Times four divided by four. So I dare say you get something other than eight there. Yeah, because if we look at order of operations, we do this four times four first. Mm -hmm. Well, hold on a second. If we're doing order of operations, oh, we start with right, the multiplication. I was something different there. Okay. Four times four, that's sixteen. And then 16 divided by 4, because we wouldn't do the addition until after we do all of our multiplication and division. 4 times 4 is 16 divided by 4. So what's 16 divided by 4? 4. And now we have 4 plus 4, which is? 8. 
So she was thinking a different way, but it actually, by accident, kind of worked out that way. That was a wonderful accident. So leave everything you've got up there, but erase that 8 times 4 equals 32 stuff. That's got to go. You know how to erase all you that. Got that. You got that. Circle pop. All right. Now, you're a bright kid, and I like the way you did that quickly. And you even found two ways by accident to solve that. Find another way to get to eight, because there are probably at least six more ways to do it. So oh. find another way to do it besides plus, multiply, and divide in that order. Okay. So divided by four, zero, and then... Oh, so we're saying four divided by four is zero? Mm. Oh, wait. Yeah. Four divided oh, by four? One. Oh, okay. 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 So maybe that wouldn't work. Four. It's sure that very hard, Minus too. But you four. could have kept going with that. Let's see what really? happens. You could have. But I think you want to get to zero is what you're thinking, right? Mm -hmm. You want to start with zero. So instead of division, you had something there instead that would get you to zero here, right? What would that be? Right. Now, something to keep in mind with order of operations, oh, yeah. right? If you want to do something that involves 4 minus 4, it's going to end up being the last thing you do. So where would you want to put it? Just to keep things organized. Okay. okay. Let's go ahead and move that out of the way then. All right. Zero. And then you, zero plus 4. Well, the way I think she was going would also work if this she started with subtracting. so many ways. Right. Wow. So that's why I was saying there's a lot of different ways. So let's, I'm just going to step Aubrey, back it's up here. to you. Go for it. Plus 4. Which... So mm -hmm. zero plus four equals four plus four equals eight. So right there you've got four and four is eight plus four is 12 minus four is eight. So that works. Now let's go back to where you were gonna do dividing first. Yeah. Let's do that and get to eight. And you've got one moment left. I'm gonna help you out here and turn this plus sign into a division symbol really fast. Hup, 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 hup. There we go. Okay. <laughs> four divided by four. One. Mm. Times four, e, times four, so that would be one times four, four, and then plus four. This is phenomenal. There so, you go. All right, so you've got a lot of different ways that you can get eight now, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. You so picked a very good number there. One more way to get eight. Okay. Now you've got 30 seconds. Because oh, you've gosh. been going pretty quick on these. Okay. You've Start already fresh. accomplished what you need to, so. Um, it's four. Eight plus four. And we're going to let you keep working on that, but for your great work so far, we're going to award you with a meal courtesy of our friends at Chick-fil-A, so congratulations on that. And we'll be back with more. See if you can get that other four right after this. Ignore the chicken sticker. We are back with Dr. Dawson Lee, and so we've been kind of going around your office. We saw the front of it, and we talked about, obviously, mathematics that are involved. Mm -hmm. What is your route? What is your route on how you got to where you are today? Well, certainly, you know, you, you finish high school, and you, you hope to get into, you know, a good, a good college, of course. So I went to a four-year university. I'm a proud UCLA Bruin, an old Bruin, 1995 Bruin. Um, and from there, after your undergrad degree, it's another four years of optometry school. So it's a grad program. Um, what's key is when you're in undergrad, taking the prerequisite courses. Heavy science, of course. Um, I was a psychobiology major, but really you can do any, you can be an English major, you can be an art major. The key is you have to have this, the core science courses that all these health professions require. Mm -hmm. Bio, physics, calculus, um, lots of different sciences there, and uh, then you do your admissions to get into optometry school, which again is a four-year program. So um, you were there for a total of eight years for your schooling? After high school, yes. Once you are done, is there any more additional that you have to continuously? Yeah, so you have options. Um, for me, I actually started working right after college, or right after optometry school. Um, but some of our associates do a residency, which is an additional one-year program. Mm -hmm. And that you can specialize in different interests, 
disease in particular, like a veteran's hospital mm -hmm. is a very common one, uh, contact lens specialty, pediatric specialty, neuroscience specialty. So you can kind of make what you want of it, um, but you don't necessarily have to. Um, quite frankly, nowadays it, it can be pretty expensive. Yeah. So you don't always have that option. <laughs> and let's face it, when I was done, I was 24 years old. You're ready. Ready yeah, you're go. ready. Yeah, you're ready to go. Well, after eight years, I assume that you're ready to go. Yeah. So here in your office, besides what you do, what other opportunities are there? Well, certainly a lot of our staff kind of work uh, from ground up. I mean, typical office staff, you've got some front folks that, you know, take care of patients at the front desk area, get insurance qualifications, take payments, again, math, right? Um, some insurance and data entry, of course. Then on the back side, you've got the billing, which is, of course, is, uh, you know, just really attention to detail and knowing how insurance systems work. That can be a little tricky. Um, where our office and where a lot of our ancillary staff help out is with patient care. Mm -hmm. And that's with, like, a little like medical assisting. You, you really in, are involved with patients and their health and taking patient histories and um, getting them worked up in a sense for the, the doctor to see. Um, and then from there, there's that weird profession part that we have, which is the optical. Yeah. So it's a little bit of medical, a little bit of retail, truthfully. Um, but ultimately, it's nice because for our patients, it's all together. Yes. So our staff, uh, I think more than anything, really embrace relationships because patients are here to be taken care of. Um, they're interested in, in seeing as good as they can and preserving health and preserving vision. So our staff, more than anything, is for instance, when we when we look for folks to work with us, we always want someone with a serving heart, because ultimately you're serving someone, you're yeah. taking care of them, you're you're holding them through the process. Because at the same time, a lot of folks are a little bit um, afraid to go to the doctor. Let's face uh, it, I, I you, they're yeah. afraid of bad news. Yes. So anyone to make that experience a little bit more comfortable and settling and easy and less fearful. Um, and of course give great service in the process. We kind of pride ourselves on that. So real quick for those high school students out there, what's the best piece of advice that you could give them? <laughs> uh, I've got a couple eighth graders and some middle sc uh, grade schoolers at home. I think is to work hard, study hard, um, do the best they can because you don't want doors to shut. And you don't know what those doors might be, but if you kind of let things go a little bit, inevitably what happens, some doors may get shut and you don't always get a chance to, you know, go back in time to redo something. Yeah. So you just do the best you can. And at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with that, right? You cannot fault yourself for, well, I tried the best I can. You can't always control the outcome, but you can absolutely give it your all so that there are more opportunities for you after high school and maybe college and even optometry afterwards. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I want to give you this from us. Awesome. Thank, thank you for you. letting us come today. It's been absolutely wonderful listening to everything that you do and all the math that's involved. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you Dr. very much. Lee. It was thank my you. pleasure. Thanks for having me. That's it from Dr. Lee and Liao Optometry. And we're sending it back to you, Mike, to the studio. All right, thanks for that, Dr. Lee, and well as Mary Lou right there. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30. Thank you to Aubrey for coming in, fifth grade student from Stockdale. Did you learn a little bit today? Yes. Did you have fun today? Yes. That's the important thing. And until we meet again, continue to do the math. Support for Do the Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Bakersfield West Rotary Stroop Family Foundation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, Kern High School District, and AC Electric Company with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.